Peace be unto you, my brothers and sisters. May the peace and blessings of Almighty Creator revealed to all and known by many names and of our positive African ancestors rest and abide with each and every one of you. May their protective hand be with you, their prosperity and wisdom. I am indeed thankful this evening to be able to gather with you in the discussion of this subject. And I'm thinking about the fact that there was a time when more than two Africans would gather together here in this hostile environment to discuss anything they were viewed with suspicion. But if they were found discussing the topics that you discuss in this place, their lives were set on the line. Tonight we're able to gather here in this setting that is truly a setting of our own creation and have our own little bit of Africa tonight, our own oasis in the midst of the storm. And so it is a wonderful experience to be able to share that with you here this evening. How you feeling? Good, you're looking good. Looking real good. I want to uh, give special uh, thanks to the um, or, uh, organization that brought us in, as it's the Af uh, AUM. UAM, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. UAM. United African Movement, isn't it? Yes, thank you. And uh, the brother Bundy who uh, was uh, so kind to and looked after me so well once I got here in the city. And thank, I'm so thankful for his kindness and care and keeping. And Dr. Felder, who I understand is one of my best press agents here, one of Fourth Dynasty's best friends. We didn't even know that you were uh, uh, with the organization. <laughs> we're all together. I understand he is the foremost press agent for Fourth Dynasty Publishing Company here. Brother Roy Canton and uh, Attorney Maddox, Brother Mark Rowley for his stimulating uh, interview on the program today. I want to thank them. Now, uh, before I get into the topic for this evening, I just have to do a black nationalist commercial uh, for a moment to mention uh, to you, you know that we are with Fourth Dynasty Publishing Company which is owned and operated by the Barashango family, and which is committed to disseminating the accurate information relative to African people. And uh, to this evening, unfortunately, I was only able to bring a few copies of African People and European Holidays, A Mental Genocide, Book One and Two, but I do have uh, a, a goodly bit of copies of God, the Bible, and the Black Man's Destiny, which covers some 800 uh, historical, biblical, and scientific facts on the African origin of the Bible, the African origin of, of Christianity, and, and many other uh, subjects along that line, as well as the very beautiful uh, African woman, the original guardian angel, which uh, uh, documents uh, some of the wonderful and major contributions but made by the black woman, her creation of an ongoing contribution to world civilization. So they are uh, available there at the table. Our topic this evening in our discussion is holidays from the perspective of African-centered historical reality. So often we are compelled by the conditions and the environment we live in to look at things in a fantasy manner, a fantastic way, rather than from the viewpoint of reality. The object of the whole African Senate movement in bringing forth accurate information, not only in terms of history, but every other field of discipline, is to be certain that we as a people are able to be confronted with and be made to deal with and to have the tools, the powerful weapons of reality. Whether that reality is pleasant or unpleasant, we must be able to deal with reality in order to be rational and sane and to reach that place for which we are being called to go. 
And that's why we entitled this uh, topic tonight, Holidays from the Perspective of African-Centered Historical Reality. Why historical reality? I'm reminded of the words of El Haj Malik El Shabazz, peace be upon him, affectionately known to us as Brother Malcolm when he said, of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward all research. And so it is. When you get into the history of something, then you have a better understanding of what it is, what it was created for, what are its purposes and objectives. So that's why we're approaching it from the perspective of an African-centered historical reality. African-centered because there is, has been, and we are still being subjected to a Eurocentric worldview. And there's still a great and wondrous struggle going on to break the bonds of that worldview. And so now we must view things from what we are, and we are an African people. I know I don't have to explain that to anybody in here tonight. And that's how you see things. It's how you look at things from your experience. We have several premises I would like to discuss with you before we get into the historical elements of the topic tonight. The first premise is holidays are the institutionalized celebrations of the thoughts and ideas of a particular philosophical worldview. What does that mean in essence? Not that you really need an explanation of it, but I always have to explain sometimes even what I say to myself. The institutionalization of our own thoughts and ideas and our own creations, part of the process of doing that and helping to keep those thoughts and ideas alive and nurturing us and motivating us in our everyday existence and our everyday struggle and fight for total mental, physical, and spiritual liberation from this beast here, from this hostile environment. As a part of that process, celebrations play a very definite role. Holidays are important to us. But in those holidays, if they do not reflect our life experience, if they do not reflect the positive aspects of our worldview, of how we see the world, of how we understand the things around us, then we have to ask the question, what good are those holidays to us? Should we be celebrating them or should we be celebrating something else? Let me stop here for a minute to discuss something that Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop set forth. And that is the idea it has always been known to us who have been aware and thinking people and in the process of, an, of continued uh, evolutionary path of enlightenment that there was a quantitative and qualitative difference between the way that we as a people look at the world and the way Europeans look at the world. Brother Malcolm stated it so beautifully and straightforward. He said, when you sit down to the table with the white man, to discuss an issue, to discuss an idea, you're not speaking the same language. It was difficult for some of the Negro leaders of that day to understand what he was talking about because they knew they were saying the same words. They were discussing the Constitution. They were discussing the Bill of Rights. They were discussing the Declaration of Independence and all those things. The white man was using the very same words that the black people were using. However, they were not speaking the same language. Simply because they had a diametrically opposed worldview. Dia puts it in these words. It's the difference between xenophobia and xenophilia. And that is the European has a fear of anything different of other people and cultures that is different from him. And therefore he must control them in some manner or eradicate them. Like the child who has never grown up, you stop running around here. Uh, here black men 
A big strapping Nubian looking black man that can snatch telephone poles up out the ground talking about, I got to go to work for the man. He not the man. You the man. He never grew up. And why do I say that? How can I say that? I can say it because Jerusalem Slim, who you call Jesus Christ, we used to call him Brother Jerusalem Slim in the seminary, said that it is by the fruit of a tree that you know what that tree is. What he produces is what you know what that tree is. And the very fact that when people do not do what he wants them to do, he acts just like a little child, like the demon seed. Either you do it or I'll hurt you. Or I'll take my marbles and get out of the game. Most of the time I wish he would just take his marbles and go on by his business. But he's not satisfied with doing that. He got to come back and try to control the game again. He's perfectly all right with me because I know left on our own, we really, when we have nothing else to do, but on our own, we can do it. And we'll do it fast. We won't drag it out then. But this xenophobia, this fear, is the motivating factor, as Dr. Francis Wilson tells us in the book, The ISIS Paper Keys to the Color, is the major motivating factor of white folks. Now, I'm going to come to the holidays, but i got to lay this groundwork here. I hope you all can be patient with me. One of the reasons is because I have to constantly be defending myself with black folks because I discuss the historical realities of the European. And I won't stop doing that. Black folks wouldn't even come out to see me a lot of time until I let some white folks come in. That's why I was so glad to get here. <laughs> One of the few places in the world where I can go where I am totally in an African environment and you don't want nothing else here but Africa. <laughs> now, African people, in their natural state of being, and most peoples of color tend to have a xenophilic approach to life. That is a love of other people, an embracing of other cultures, a sharing of culture. So you have these two different things. So now, when you celebrate European holidays, whose major motivation is the fear of his genetic annihilation, his phobia of other human beings, what type of celebrations do he have? Those celebrations that are built around that world view, which is essentially xenophobic. When you celebrate that, you are celebrating something opposed to your very nature because you are by nature in your natural state, and I'm saying natural state now, because a lot of us didn't got out of our natural state, we didn't grieve the Holy Ghost, as Jesus talked about. If you know what that means, those who understand, let them understand what has been said. And when you are in your natural state, your idea and purposes for a celebration is different. So I wanted to uh, deal with that first premise. You still with me? You all right? The second premise, the celebration of holidays establishes and helps to maintain a strong emotional and cultural bond between you and that which you are celebrating a strong emotional and cultural bond between you and that which you are celebrating. Anything that you jump up and down and sing about and dance about long enough becomes very much a part of your being and you feel something for that because it brought you joy at the time that you were doing it. So you have an emotional and a cultural bond and connection with it. The question arises, when we celebrate European holidays, what are we binding ourselves to? Another question on that third premise, on that second premise. The third and final premise here. Holidays are very common and natural to human beings. And you should have times to celebrate. I'm involved in the African liberation struggle until I am taken home to my ancestors. Unless I should lose my mind, and when I do that, somebody please put me out of my misery. Because if Ishaka Musa is no longer involved in the liberation movement, then you know he has gone plumb crazy. And he needs to be taken and worked with and to bring all the African Senate uh, behavioral scientists to try to heal me and lock me up till I get straightened out. As long as I'm in my right mind, I'm committed to the African liberation struggle. 
However, I do not view it as a struggle. It said it's the African liberation movement. Because many times when brothers and sisters get to talk about we involved in the struggle, they make it hard for themselves and anybody else who may be interested in it. It is a happy thing that we do, those who are participating in it. We chose that this is the road we would go rather than be manipulated and controlled by something or someone else. Now that's a happy choice. That's a choice that a lot of people don't even know they have. So now the fact that you made that choice, you must be a happy warrior. It must be a joyful task. You fight better when you're happy. Even if you, when it comes to the point where you have to take an enemy's head off, do it with a smile. And by all means, when you talking to your brothers and sisters, always talk up. Always speak hope, always speak joy, always speak the fulfillment of the promise that has been given to our mothers and our fathers ever since the days that we were brought off the slave ships here. They knew from generation to generation that this day would come. So talk in them terms. I have it in my household. When I ask my children what happened, they have to respond on demand. Say, what's happening? Black folk on the rise. Don't tell me I don't know. Some stuff like that. And when they forget, I keep asking the question until I get the answer I want. They get tired of it, but at least it's a part of the right programming process, <laughs> conditioning process. So it's natural for us to be happy and to celebrate. We started out by celebrating the harvest and on our own land when we created the science of agriculture, the success of the hunt, uh, the rituals and celebrations of the rites of passage, all these things are good reasons for celebration. For us, we have a lot to celebrate in that we were able to survive this beast all this time in this hostile environment and still come out with some degree of sanity. I said some degree because as Dr. Ben says, we are all crazy to some extent, having been here and survived under these conditions. But we're still able to function. And also we celebrated so often victory over an enemy. But never in the history of the world have I ever heard of a people celebrating the victory of their enemies over them. Do you get my point here? They may remember that, but they will not celebrate it. The only people I know now presently in the world is the Negro and other people who are mentally subjugated by white supremacist uh, 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 culture around the world that celebrate their enemies' defeat of them. So when we study European holidays, we have to ask, whose victory are we celebrating? All right, I, I hope y'all don't get angry with me in here. Now, I don't mean to be a killjoy. But I just have to deal with history, the story, our story, as it is. Now, I'm going to attempt to, and you'll have to let me know when my time is coming up, because uh, I just documented, I ain't got time, watch, watch. <laughs> I have to move with the spirit. And in the spirit world, we don't know nothing about no time. We get in there. But I know y'all got things doing that thing, so you have to let me know when I get there, all right? I'm just going on now. We're gonna to try to deal with five European holidays, some historical perspective on them. And that is, who discovered Columbus? Because he sure didn't discover me. The second one is Halloween, and I forgot which sister, who was the sister on the radio program, Dr. Felder with us that day at WLIB? that came up with that, the, the, the Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> Misgiving, a celebration of horrors. Xmas, the merry mess. <laughs> and even if I don't get to some of the others, I'm gonna talk about America's Independence Day, the 4th of July, I'm gonna get to that one if I don't get to nothing. <laughs> so y'all pray for me now. Y'all send out good vibrations so I can hit them. 
In order to deal with this who discovered Columbus, and I'm, I'm, I'm starting out with the Columbus Day thing because that's how they begin the whole holiday season here in this country. That opens the whole thing up. And the reason why I'm putting a lot of emphasis on that this evening is because all this year here in 1992, they're going to be talking about the quincentennial of the coming of Columbus. And they will be bombarding our children's minds with this, intimidating them with this. And their peers will be looking at them and saying, why are you not into this? And we have to give them a strong, sound historical basis and logical basis upon which to say, I just ain't with that. That ain't down. That ain't happening for me. I dish that, if that's what they say in the world. And this is the reason why I recommend that. I didn't come here to tell you what to do or to make any choices for you, only to show you the other side of the coin. Some of you have already seen that side of the coin, but it ain't going to hurt us to look at it again. At that time period, talking about 1492 now, we must assess here briefly what was going on in the world then. Contrary to what we have been miseducated to believe, the world was not waiting for white folks to come and bring them Christianity, civilization, or any other thing. They didn't, even, they didn't invite them and they weren't looking for them. They did not need them for anything whatsoever. If you study what was going on in the Olmec and the Mayan and the Aztec civilizations here and what was going on in China and in India and everywhere else around the world and on the mother continent, nobody needed what white folks had to offer. So I want to get that clear. So there was nothing they could bring us but misery, as history has shown. Why do I say that? First of all, I have to go back about 700 years or so before 1492, if y'all don't mind. Talk about one of the great periods of the many wonderful periods of our history on this planet. And that's when the Moors, left from the motherland, went over and on the island which later became known as Gibraltar under Gibal Tariq and from their base of operations and their fort there on the rock of Hercules between the pillars of Hercules as they call it they moved now into Spain they were 80 percent indigenous jet black broad nose thick lip kinky head Africa that is what the documents of history say not what I say this is empirical evidence we're talking about here. 20% so-called Semitic Arabs who joined in. The Semitic Arabs or Muslims had nothing to bring to the Muslims on the motherland. When they left out of Arabia when, and, and were traveling around for their conquest, they left with a little more knowledge than how to raise camels and how to feed, have her sheep. It was only after they went in and conquered Egypt that they now come out with this new life and knowledge. This resurrection of the old classics and, and the zero and all that. And it was the indigenous Africans still living in what came to be misnomered as Egypt in Kemet there, which introduced them and taught them just like they had taught the Greeks, the Romans, and everyone else who had conquered them. For as Asa Hilliard tells us, they conquered us militarily, but we always conquered them culturally and scientifically, for we had the knowledge to do that. Why, even in slavery, they had to depend on the black slaves to teach them how to do things. So even though we were their slave, we still had to conquer them morally and intellectually. I want you to think about that. They didn't have to teach us how to read and write when we first got here. We already knew how to do that. It was only the next generations where they had taken that from. But we had to come back and learn that again. Most of them who brought us here couldn't read and write. <laughs> now at the time that these Africans went into Spain, not five kings or queens throughout all of Europe 
in any of their nations could read or write. Not five were literate. And couldn't anybody read the Bible but a few of the priests who could read and it was chained to the wall so that only they could read it. The common people did not have it. I'm trying to get you these good god fearing people with these halos around their head that came and over here killed up the indigenous red man and captured us and brought us the light of God and Christianity and Jesus. <laughs> Most of them didn't know it, so how could they teach us anything about it? Now when the Moors came in, they brought with them the light of knowledge and established the first universities there. They also taught geography from globes. That's a matter of record. They taught from globes. And even after they taught in Spain for some 800 years, the Spanish still believed that the world was flat. A hard people to teach. And if you haven't learned that by now, as the song says, if you don't know it by now, you'll never, never know it. Why am I going through all this? Because the African had been sailing ships up and down the Nile, up and down the Niger, up and down the Senegal River for thousands of years. Navigational science was a way of life to him. That kind of knowledge did not exist in Europe before the Africans, before the Moors went and took it to Europe. I'm sorry we did it, but it happened. Now, in 1310, Mansa Muhammad Abu Bakari II looked out over the Ethiopian Sea. It wasn't called the Atlantic Ocean. It was the Ethiopian Sea. How do I know that? Because I looked at the maps of the, of the 15th and the 16th century. There. And others have looked at it. He looked out over the sea. He said, if we can navigate the Niger, he was the uh, emperor of the Mali Empire at that time. He said, if we can navigate the Sahara Desert, we can deal with that Ethiopian sea out there. So he went to work building. He went to work building with a knowledge which had been preserved by the University of San Corre at Timbuktu and other university systems right there in the motherland. And he sent out 200 ships, 100 with crews of Africans, and 100 for supplies to carry them for two years if necessary. Now, I mean, if you think you can go on an ocean for two years, you bad stuff. You know something. Because the man loved his people, he was responsible for the people, he was a leadership, he wouldn't send them out somewhere not knowing where he was sending them. And he told them, say, don't stop till you come to land. I know there's land over there because our people have been traveling over there ever since the days of the pharaohs and possibly before. Some time passed by and only one ship came back. And the ship captain that came back, according to the report given by Abu Bakari's successor, says that his report went thusly. Sire, we traveled and we followed the wind gust that would take us straight across the Ethiopian Sea. But we reached a place where there was a great churning river and, a, and, and, a, and an awesome mist. And all the other ships went into that mist and I never saw them again. We somehow got spent out of it and were headed back in this direction so we came home. So what did Abu Bakari II do? In 1311, I said, 13, what, what year did I say? 1310, now we have 1311. How far is that from 1492? 1311 now, this black man says, hook me up 400 ships. 200 to carry people and 200 to carry supplies. 
and I'll see you later. He gave him five and got in the wind. After conf Emperorship on Mansa Kong Kong Ganga Musa. He was never heard from on the continent again. But the records of the Aztecs, the Olmecs, and some of the other people there kept recorded that a strange group appeared on their land. Hundreds upon hundreds of black men with gold spears and golden shields, and one tall, jet black man with gold in his braids and his hair, golden slippers, stood under a golden pavilion. And the indigenous bowed down and said, Hail, our God, Quetzalcoatl has returned. That's in 1311. Now, before I get back up to 13, uh, 1492, y'all all right? Okay, I don't, I don't want to bore you with all this stuff. Either. Before I get up to 1492, I got a couple, of, a couple of more dates. Because it's impossible to talk about Columbus without a whole bunch of other names coming up before you. Of course, we know Cortez, Hernandez, Balboa, and all the rest of them. None of them were noble people. They were not noble men. They were criminals, sea dogs, pirates, and deserve no honor from us. But also there is Prince Henry the Navigator, Bartholomew Diaz, Vasco da Gama, and Jan von Rybeck. Because at the time now that they were preparing when they were about to drive out. And I got to come back to 1492 and then switch back a minute. I'll be coming back and forth, but you, you can hang with me. The last stronghold of the Moors, who had been there for some 800 years, and as Dr. John Henry Clark said, it was one of the few times that Africans had partnerships with other people, and they came out all right for a while. The Arabs betrayed us in the end. The Jews we brought into Europe helped to get us out of, the black Jews we brought in, undermined us with the Spanish to help the downfall of the last stronghold of the Moorish Empire of the Kingdom of Granada in 1492. The same year that your boy made his travel, got lost. When they drove the Moors out of Spain, this is what they declared. We cannot afford to be embarrassed by the superior intelligence of these people any longer. They must not be allowed to get themselves strengthened and come back here again. They will never rise again. And the only way to stop them is to go to the lands from which they emanate and stop them. We couldn't do that before because we did not know how to navigate the sea. We did not know how to build ships. But now that we have run them out of here, we can take the knowledge that they left behind and we can now go and exploit the world. Not explore the world, exploit the world. And in that way, we can continue to ensure our genetic survival. And so in 1444, Prince Henry, Henry the Navigator leaves out of Portugal and heads down the west coast of Ake Bulan, commonly known as Africa. Because the Portuguese were heading for Africa, the Italians and the French and the Germans were still trading with the east, but Spain couldn't get through to the east because they would have had to fight the Germans, the French, and the Italians to do it. They would have had to fight the Portuguese to get to Africa, so Spain said the only place for us to go is west. No place else to go. But we got to find some land to exploit or the other nations around us are going to become so strong and so rich and they will whip us and, and subjugate us to them. These are Europeans talking about fighting among Europeans now. Prince Henry the Navigator comes down to the Congo and takes back, begins immediately after taking back four of Mother Africa's children begins to recommend the slave trade from there to bring and import Africans into slavery into Portugal. In 1487 to 1488, Bartholomew Diaz, 
another Portuguese, rounded the, the, the Cape of what they call Good Hope in southern Arkebu land, Anzania, because I don't know where South Africa is. I look on the map, I cannot find it. I know where Anzania is. That's what the people who are struggling there for their liberation call it. Then in 1497, Vasco de Gama rounded that cape and found the route they were looking for to India. What it was, these people were going hungry. They were suffering from diseases. They were dis being decimated by the plague and everything else. So they were going to other lands to find medicines, to find other things to, for their own survival. They were not going to carry the light of civilization. They were not going to bring people to Jesus. They were not going for any of those reasons. They were going for economic reasons and strictly survival reasons. That's what it was all about. That's why I say when they tell your children in school about the, the great explorers, no! They were exploiters. They were not explorers. But here's the kicker. I'm going to be back to 1492 in a minute. In 1652, the Dutch East India Company, which was trading in the slaves, most of its money was made from slave trade of African slaves, sent and a naval surgeon named John von Rybeck, and he established the first white settlement in Anzania known as Cape Town. Now why am I going through all that? Because African children there who are compelled by the miseducation system, the white supremacist miseducation system of the USA there, the United, uh, 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 the Union of South Africa, same initials as the United States of America, tell these children that they must celebrate the arrival of Vasco da Gama, Bartholomew Diaz, and Jean von Rybeck. And their arrival opened up the door for the destruction of their civilization and the state that they're in now. Now that is mental and cultural genocide. However, many of us here have no problem seeing that in relationship to Anzania, but we have a problem seeing it in relationship to our experience here in America. And I say, and I hope I can back it up, that to tell our children to celebrate Columbus Day is the same as telling our brothers and sisters on the continent to celebrate the arrival of John von Rybeck. The same equation. Now why do I say that? Let me give you a little background on Christopher here. Drop my notes down here somewhere. Hold on, man. I'll be with you. I'm not gone. <laughs> Let me get a little background on him. First of all, his name was Cristobal Colon. He was a Jew. A Jew. His parents were Jews born in Spain who were baptized Jews, Christianized Jews, to survive there in Europe, because the Europeans were running the Jews all over. I mean, they were giving them hell there in Europe. I have to say that. He was a Christianized Jew who was born to a mother and father who was in the weaving business. At the age of 14, he became a sailor. And it settled in Genoa, Italy. Now, in his travels to the west coast of Africa and other ships he had sailed on, he learned about several things. One, he learned about the Moors having taught that the earth was round from the globes they taught geography when they were in Spain and they were still using now and the, at the universities in West Africa. He also purchased a map that was used by the Moorish sea kings who had mapped out the route going across the Ethiopian Sea, coming here to what was later to be Misnomah, the Americas. This was very precious 
You ever read in those comic books about finding a, a map that shows you hidden treasure and people hold it and say, God, that's what he did with that. That's why he could run around saying to the other ignorant ones, uh, the world is round, give me some money and I'll prove it. Well, how you know that? Well, I can't let you know, just give me some money. <laughs> you know? He was selling the information, the economic thing. When he came to, I'm not gonna go through the whole story there with him, but when he came to Isabella and Ferdinand to, with his plan, they originally had rejected him. But there was one person who came and saved the day for Columbus. And his name was Luis de Santanda, a baptized Jew who was finance minister to Ferdinand. And he said to Isabella, who said, well, now I don't have that much money. Maybe I can, to finance a venture like this, I can pawn my jewels. You know we heard in school that she pawned her jewels? No, she didn't. He told her, you don't have to do that because I have a cartel of money lenders. Why did he have a cartel of money lenders? Because one of the few businesses the Jews were allowed to engage in in Europe was pawnbroking money lending. And therefore they developed a mercantile class which gave them outreach and connections and networking with other nations. So by, they had that hookup that by the time of the Rothschilds spread everywhere all over Europe. And they had to finance every war that Europe went into. There. Now, he goes to his cartel, which consists of Don Isaac Abrabanel, Juan Cabrero, and Abraham Senor. All Jews. They raised $98,000 to get the three ships for Columbus to come over here. On his way over here, he has to stop, go down, because you can't come over here unless you went down the west coast of Africa. And one of the reasons why he went to the west coast of Africa is, is a brother he had met when he was there before that would be most vital to that mission, that lived in Sierra Leone. His name was Pedro Alonso Nina one of the most celebrated navigators in the world at that time. Put him upon the ship, either the Pinta or the Nina, I don't remember which one now. Santa Maria, thank you. And they now come over, they're on their way over here, but they don't go further enough to the south and the wind can't carry them directly to Brazil, so they're delayed for some time and it's an arduous journey. The journey is so bad that the crew threatens to mutiny. And they tell him, if we don't see some land soon, we're going to throw your butt off the ship and we're going back to Spain. Because Cologne said, the king queen told him, he said, man, I can't go back without something. They didn't let me this money because he made them promise to make him admiral of the sea and that he could get 10% of everything he could steal once he got here. It was an economic venture now, I'm telling you. So now he comes, uh, he's almost, he's not far from land, they're about to commit mutiny, and I understand, I'm told that Pedro Alonso Nina looks off of his ship and he sees floating in the water twig with leaves on it and some blossoms, which is a sure sign that they're not far from land. So he says, hold on, don't mutiny yet. We gotta be near land to see something like that. And then a few hours later, they do see land. I'm not proud of it, but the brother saved Christopher Cologne's behind right then and there. Now, when he gets here, this is the report he gives to Spain when he returns. He leaves a, a large portion of his crew here on the island of what was to co become known as Haiti. I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that in a minute. You all right? Yeah. You're all so quiet out there. I hope I ain't boring you. <laughs> when he gets to bring his report back to Spain, I know I'm hopping around quite a bit, but I'm trying to cover a lot in a few minutes here. 
And as I read from uh, African People and European Holidays, uh, Mental Genocide, Book 1, page 32, this is a report that Christopher Colon made to his sovereigns in Spain. He's describing the people he encountered here. The people he what? That means the people that were what? Already here. As one comedian said, you can't discover nobody who don't want to be discovered. How are you going to discover something that's already there? He says this, so tractable, so peaceful are these people that I swear to your majesties, there is not in the world a better nation. Do you hear what he's saying? This white man that was supposed to have to come to these savages and stop them from eating up each other and teach them about God and everything and civilize them, he's saying he, he has never encountered a better nation than what he encountered of these people here. They love their neighbors as themselves. What'd he say? I thought we had to wait until the white man come to teach us that. <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself. That's a part of the Christian doctrine, love your neighbor as yourself. These people already had it. They didn't need anybody to bring it to them. It was already here. And their discourse is ever sweet and gentle and accompanied with a smile. And though it is true that they are naked, now to Europeans, anybody that wasn't covered from head to toe was naked. Because as Francis tell you, they had a problem with their own physical body. African people and people of color like to get that sun, get that rock into them. Women could walk around bare-breasted because they would not be disrespected. Nobody would disrespect. Couldn't do that today because of my mind's been twisted all out of shape. But it was uh, nobody would think to disrespect an African woman in those days. It was unheard of, and it could cost you your life. In some communities to today, it can cost you your life. It says that though they are naked, yet their manners are decorous and praiseworthy. Columbus goes on to recommend that these friendly and hospitable people be made to work and sow and do all that is necessary to adopt our ways. Do you dig that? Sheer arrogance to adopt our ways. The people were all right the way they were. They didn't need anything from him. after which he displayed the 10 Taino Indians he had captured and brought to Spain. Now, on his second voyage back, I've got to read something to you, is that all right? And so some people won't call me a racist in reverse, I'm gonna read from a white man this time, okay? <laughs> Will Durant in the Story of Civilization, volume six. This is what he wrote about it. When Columbus returned on his second voyage, after uh, he had left this colony of Spaniards there on the island of Haiti, he returns now and, mercy, hold on again, to this island to see what had happened, what had taken place while he was gone making his report to Spain. This is his second journey now. And it says here that 10 months after leaving these people there, that hardly a man remained of the colony, remained of it. The Europeans, and this is in Will Durant's language now, had roamed the island, robbing the natives of gold and women. They had established a tropical paradise with five women to each man. They had quarreled and murdered one another, and nearly all the rest had been killed by the outraged Indians. Now the brothers had opened up their arms and said, come on in, there's plenty, you know. We'll share. These folk acted so bad, they made the bloods bad there, and they started killing them, which was their right to do. They said they should have slain them at the bay in the first place. What? I'm not talking violence, I'm not talking hatred, I'm talking our survival. He, he goes on to write, he turned back towards Haiti October, he left another colony there now and he went on to explore some other islands, right? He looked for some other islands to explore because up until this time he hadn't found really anything to take home but those 10 uh, 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 indigenous, 
indigenized there, uh, which they called Indians there. And, and uh, Isabella and Ferdinand said, you better come up with something more than that, because we got to pay this $98,000 back to them Jews. So you better come up with something. That ain't going to get it. He turned back towards Haiti October the 29th, 1494, wondering how his new settlement had fared. He was shocked to find that it had behaved like its predecessor, that the Spaniards had raped native women, stolen native stores of food, and kidnapped native boys to serve as slaves, and that the natives had killed many Spaniards in revenge. Columbus himself now became a slave dealer. L let me read that again. Listen very carefully to this. Written by Will Durant, one of the four, Dr. Will Durant, one of the foremost uh, European historians. In the Story of Civilization, volume six, page 265. If you don't have it, go to the library and check it out for yourself. Columbus himself now became a slaveholder. He sent out expeditions to capture 1,500 natives. 400 of these he gave to settlers. 500 he dispatched to Spain. 200 of these died on the voyages. The survivors were sold at Seville, but died in a few years unable to adjust themselves to the colder climate or perhaps to the savagery of civilization. <laughs> Brother sit over there, sicilization. Syphilization. The third settlement that he left here had survived, but one of every four of the 500 Spanish years that he left there in 1496 was suffering from syphilis. And the settlers had divided into two hostile groups that were now on the verge of war. These folk just love war. To appease the discontent, Columbus allowed each man to appropriate a large tract of land and to enslave the natives dwelling on it. This became the rule in Spanish settlements. With him on this voyage in 1498, as he crossed the Ethiopian Sea, he passed Africans on their way back home, carrying cargo. And when he got here, he said, what was that I saw? They said, oh, them the brothers from over there. They've been coming, the sun people. They've been coming here a long time. They brought us some gold, we gave them some things. They took back, they'll be back later. They do that all the time. With him was one of the most infamous creatures that has ever walked on the face of the earth. Bishop Bartholomew Las Casas. He looked at the situation, he said, these people can't stand up on the hard labor. They make their living enjoying life. They fish, they hunt, they weave, they make rugs and things. They can't stand up under that hard labor. We're gonna have to look somewhere else. Say, now the Portuguese have Africans and they can do the work of 10 of these indigos, as they call them. So then he went to the Pope of Rome, the vicar of the Son of God on earth, who once wrote in their catechism, Pope Leo X said, the Lord our God no longer reigns. He has given all power to me. I'm not picking on him by religion. That's in their history. who had the keys to the kingdom, and walked in the shoes of the fishermen, and got permission to capture and enslave African people and bring them to the Spanish colonies, which opened the whole door to the slave trade, became the basis of America's economy, which we'll be talking about later on there. My brothers and sisters, I present to you the question, is it logical, is it sane for us or our children to celebrate the arrival of a slaver, a person who dealt in the slave trade, 
a person who opened the door for the genocide and destruction, not only of the red nations here, but the black nations that were here as well. And then on the heels of that, to capture our ancestors and to bring them here and to subject them to the worst cruelty that has ever been known in the history of the entire world. There is nothing to match this. This is the greatest of all holocausts. Would they tell me somewhere between 150 to 200,000 million lost in the Middle Passage alone, not to mention the suffering wreaked in the destruction on all of the civilizations which were existing there on the continent and the pain and deprivation after we were brought here. So is there that, that one move by Columbus opened the door to the Western Hemisphere for that kind of activity. So what is there to celebrate in that? I hope you don't get angry with me for sharing that with you. I'm gonna leave that alone now. We move on to the next holiday. Y'all all right? Yeah. You still with me? Let's talk about Halloween, Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I thought my time was up. <laughs> now, in order to, to get to this, I'm going to have to go a little further back in history. Now, we went back to 13, 10, 7, 11. I'm going to have to go all the way back 200,000 BP. Now, don't get upset because I guess you think and say, this brother have talked from 7-Eleven and it took him all this time to get to 1492. How long is it gonna take him to get from 200,000 back then? Well, I won't be able to give as much detail. I'm just gonna touch on some things. But I think it's important to lay this sound historical basis to demonstrate the dichotomy here that I'm talking about in reference to this Night of the Living Dead. Now, Paleoanthropologists, anthropologists, and a whole bunch of other scientists uh, are not agreed totally on the uh, fact that uh, Homo habilis, which existed some two million years ago on the con mother continent, was really a human being or not. There's still some discussion over that. But the one thing we do know for certain that no uh, sane uh, anthropologist can argue with is that by 200,000 years ago, human beings, Homo sapiens sapiens, modern human beings had developed and had developed nowhere else but on the continent of Akebu land. Now that is a fact that only a fool would try to dispute. That has been proven in so many ways to uh, uh, the uh, genetic system of, of uh, the bi biology system, I'm trying to think of the, the, the term for that field, through osteology, through so many pouring over the bones, through all kind of ways. They have come to that biogenetics, that's what it is. Now, these people who lived some 200,000 years ago produced out of this woman who was to become the mother of all humanity, this queen of the universe, who was that all humans, and some of her children, I'm sure she don't want today, but everybody can trace the ancestry back to this woman. So naturally, if they can trace it back to this woman, and women can't have children by themselves, they must be able to trace it back to a black man, an African. They, sometime between 90,000, and 150,000 years ago, and, and Sheikh Ante Dia puts it 150,000, began to migrate out of the mother continent to other places in the world, and they covered the globe at that time. They took with them, according to Dr. Rebecca Khan of uh, the uh, University of Hawaii, they took with them a special advantage that nobody else on earth had at the time. They were more advanced than anyone else. And I do detail that in my book, African Woman, the Original Guardian Angel there, and go more in depth on what I'm talking about here now. They encountered another group that was existing on Earth at the time, Homo Neanderthalensis. 
who we're not sure whether they were actually human or what. It's a lot of argument over what they were. They were still pigmented of skin, very dark. However, those that lived in Africa had a black hair covering or dark brown. Those who lived in Palestine and Asia had a sort of tannish color, and those in Europe had a reddish color after being there for some time. Now the great, great warm Galatian came, as you know, a glaciation came about of the ice age there about 125,000 years ago. And after that, we find no more of them. About 35,000 years ago, they become extinct. Now either through the recessive genes process, they become the who appears about 20,000 years ago, or they disappear, and this group known as the Nubian Grimaldi who had traveled there in Europe about 40,000 years ago, become bleached out and the Cro-Magnon after the Ice Age. What I'm saying in essence, there was no record of any leucoderm, that's people without skin color, on the face of the earth, no, no Caucasian whatsoever before between 20 and 25,000 years ago, and we have a history of African people for at least 200,000 years. Now, why am I raising all this fuss here about that? This is the reason. The Nubian Grimaldi, when they went there into Europe and in Siberia and the other places we find their bones and their artwork, we find that they had a burial custom and system, which the later cro magnon the immediate predecessor of the Caucasian race, did not have. It was a long time before Caucasians practiced burial. They practiced uh, um, cremation because they were nomadic. They, they, they weren't sedentary people. They didn't settle on land. Africans had a penchant for land and settling on land. No matter how harsh the conditions, they were going to make that land work for them because they had an attunement with land. Now, in their burial systems, the Nubian Grimaldi showed Ritual. There's evidence left behind of the rituals to their ancestors. They had a love of and adoration for their departed. Because to the African, until we were brainwashed and conditioned by invaders, there was no such concept as death. You understand what I'm saying to you? There was only the cycle of life, the passing of the rites of passing. And that even though you left your physical body, your spirit went back to the atoms and molecules, to the cosmos, only to return sometime in future children or future generations, or maybe tomorrow at the next child coming in while you're leaving out. How many times have you looked in the face of your children and saw your mother and your grandmother and your granddaddy and so forth? That's because the African never died. So if you never die, there is no fear of death. And that's why our warriors and soldiers of the past were such fearsome warriors. Because they didn't have a concept of death. And you can't threaten a person with death, you can't threaten them with nothing. <laughs> Contrary to that, once again now, we see this difference of worldview. The Europeans, who came later there to be known as the, because I don't have time to go into all the history of it now, it's, it's a lot. I, I cover that in African People and European Holidays of Mental Genocide, book two. There came another group of Africans into that area of Europe known as Iberians between 8,000 and 3,000 before the Common Era. And they came to be known as the Celtic Iberians. They were Kushites who came there. They were driven, some of them further north, some of them to Wales and further west and back down into Africa by the invasion of the posterity of the Scythians who used to go to war wearing a black cape buck naked. That's historical. And the first person they slew in battle, they jumped on them, bit them, and sucked out blood. That's where the whole concept of the vampire come from. The Greeks later followed that up by going to battle naked and shit. You can look in there in some of these pictorial books put out by Time Life and they'll show you that. And they were going to battle naked with just the cape and the, and the, and the shield and the helmet because the first person they came across, they uh, committed homosexual act with them as a symbol of total conquest. So my brothers, 
we should find ourselves incarcerated in those concentration camps. We not Greeks, we bees Africans. And we do not allow ourselves to be degenerated to the level of a beast. So we tuck our nature under, we put our nature in the hands of the creator. And we let our spirit and mind take over. Because the one doing the pounding is as bad as the one that's been over. You both faggots. <laughs> Once since the sapphire find out about that, she should never have nothing to do with you ever again in life. <laughs> well, brothers don't like it when I talk like that when I go to them prisons, but I tell them that, man. <laughs> you up in there doing some of everything, and when you get out, you're going to come home and endanger these women, no telling what you bring in there. Mm. <laughs> if you can't act like you're supposed to act, and be a man, you don't deserve no woman. That's a blessing. Not a privilege, blessing. Let me get off of that a minute. And brothers, I'm not coming up, I'm a brother. If we don't get this thing set right, we ain't gonna never be men. If we don't view these women the way they're supposed to be viewed and treated, we will never be men. Not ever, it is impossible to come through that unless you treat your mama right. And every African woman at some time is your mama. Just like you her father in some capacity. And I'm saying that because, I didn't mean to get into that, but get, you can read it in African Woman, the original guardian angel. It does not mean that the woman is greater than the man or the man is greater than the woman. African people rule the world side by side as equals. We didn't get caught all up into that. That's a European problem. Maybe we can deal with that in the question and answer. I can't get into it now. But let me get on now. I've gotten off the subject. Let me get back now. When these uh, Scythians now began to drive the other Europeans, the Teutons and the, the uh, Jutes and the Angles and some of the other, other Germanics, drive them west, they now put pressure on the Iberians that were there, the black folks who were there. And when they took over, they also co-opted the great culture that these black folks had. These were the folks who built Stonehenge and so many other of those megaliths up there in Europe. And I didn't write that. Some English historians out of the latter half of the 19th century, Gerald Massey and Albert Churchward and Sir Godfrey Higgins, who says he was exasperated by the fact that every time he went to study the origin of nations, he always ended up at something black. That's what he said, isn't that? In Anacalypsis, book one. For a long time, you couldn't even get a copy of it. We stirred it up so bad, they figured, well, it's better to make that money. We can always try to take knowledge from them later. They don't know this is a different time. Different place. Well, they came in and they came to be known as Celts. So you had two types of Celts. You had the black Celts who brought the bagpipe and everything. The bagpipe and everything comes out of an African tradition. And you see it with the African uh, uh, scientific symbol of the god Bess there and the wearing of the kilts, that was brought in by African people. Well, they co-opted that culture, and they became, uh, uh, there were the Britain and the Gaulish Celts. Most of them settled in Britain and in Gaul. Now, out of them, there came a group of priests known as Druids, who took the knowledge that was left behind by the Africans, and once again, co-opted and corrupted it, and in place of ancestor reverence, they came up with Shawin or Shawin's feast festival of the dead, or Satan's Sabbath, what it is called. And during this festival, now note the contrast, Africans pour a libation and invite their ancestors to come. Please come, be with us. Come, join us at our festivals and holidays and celebrations, we invite our ancestors, right? Europeans say, please don't come, stay, keep you behind in the ground. 
Because on October the 31st, which was their new year, it was believed that the earth opened up in the center, all the dead came out and started harassing everybody. <laughs> Goblins and ghosts and stuff. And they figured the only way they could placate them was to give them gifts. And that's where the trick or treat came from. And when that wouldn't work, they even painted their driveways a different color so that they could throw them off. They wouldn't come back to their house no more. <laughs> they figured if they put on costumes and look like something or somebody else, they could throw them off. This is where the Halloween costume thing comes from. All together, different worldview we're talking about there. All together, different understanding about things. We love our departed because we know no dead. They're our ancestors. We love and adore them and invite them to be with us. They're scared to death of the dead. They got to placate the dead. Another group they were frightened of because the whole European historical experience, and I'm not being hateful or racist and reverse and all that kind of foolishness. I'm telling historical truth. The whole motivation of the European throughout his history has been fear. Fear of everything and everybody. Fear. How do I know that? If you don't think, open the King James Version of the Bible and you will read, fear God and give glory to him. That is not the way it was originally written. It was honor God and give glory to him. But he put fear because fear and honor are one and the same thing to him. So working out of that fear also as a part of the symbolism of Halloween, you know, Hallow's Eve, we find gnomes, fairies, brownies, and things. And actually, they were the Twa people who lived up in Scandinavia, these black people who knew how to, uh, uh, who were metallurgists and were doctors knew medicine, knew so many things that the Druids and others didn't know, so they figured they were magical. So in those fairy tales, they're talking about the magical Africa many times. The dwarfs, and then they were sharp people, smart people. And they could do all those things, and they could make the weapons. They were just like, so they feared them. So that, that, that is a, shows their uh, a diametric difference of worldview. You still with me? Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to get off this on some of the others as quick as I can, all right? Witches. Any woman that knew something that a white man didn't know, whether she was black or white, was a witch in Europe. You don't have to take my word for it. You just go and read the history of Europe. How many women who hadn't committed any crime were burnt at the stake for just eating an apple? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Them were some ignorant people, man. They couldn't teach us anything. Some black folks, because you talk so bad about the white man. I'm just telling the history. And if they hadn't acted the way they acted, you wouldn't have to get down on it like that. But I mean, now, you know, it's out there. I'm not backing up off it. I'm not going to carry his burden around. He got to pay for that. I got a planet to redeem. I ain't got time messing around with him. I brought him the religion of Osar, which they call Osiris. And he said he was going to do better when I converted him to that. And then he co-opted co that and messed it up. I brought him the religion of, of Buddha. And he said, oh yeah, I'll get into that and I'll be a better person. He messed that up. Exterminated as many Buddhists as he could and set up Brahminism. Brahminism. Brought him the religion of Judaism under Moses. He messed that up. Brought him uh, Christianity, he sure messed that up. <laughs> Brought him Islam and he fooled with that. I ain't got no more time for the cat, man. <laughs> Anybody, I've been fighting for 20,000 years, man, I'm tired. If we've been fighting 20,000 years and we ain't been able to settle this stuff, man, we ain't gonna settle it. That's it, so you go on your way and I'm going my way. That's it, I ain't got th this, the energy. After all, you done made the lifespan so short. 
that I ain't got the time to spend. The average African, when the Greeks, when Herodotus went into Africa, when they finally were allowed to come into Africa, when the Greeks came into Africa, they found Africans living to be the average of 120 years old. In the heyday of the Roman Empire, according to Ripley's Believe It or Not, 22 years old was the average lifespan. Anybody living to be 50 years old in Europe was automatically a god. If you were 80, you were divine. <laughs> but here's the thing, man, I'm gonna get back to the witches in a minute. That's the trouble with a preacher and a historian, the two get mixed up in there somewhere. <laughs> if I, you know, that really make me mad though, because I'm on my 120, man. You understand what I'm saying? You had 22 and I had 120. Now I'm lucky if I make it to 65. Oh, we gotta change this. We gotta change this. You didn't do me no good. No good, no, you can't get nothing else from me. I was just reading a book on gerontology and the doctors are saying that you should be able to live to be 120 years old easily. Very easily. How come we're not getting that in our communities and in our neighborhood? Because we don't control the means of production. We don't control the land that we live on. We don't control what comes into our communities that we have to sustain ourselves with. That's why. So no, I ain't giving up nothing. No more. And with my people, man, when you finish, when you gave them all the love they're supposed to have, you ain't got nothing left. So these witches now who had this, uh, women were, African women were the founders of, 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 of the sciences of the world. And they taught them to the men. Brothers, don't be upset about that. And we document that. You know Dr. Ben taught you that and many others taught you that. Documented that. I had to wrestle with it first myself when he first revealed it to me, but I know it's the reality. <laughs> Made me a better man for it. And the black cat, who's always accompanied, shown with the witches, was a symbol of an African deity known as Heheru, the mother of the harvest. And one of her symbols was the apple and the apple tree. So that's why the two were associated together. When I say, uh, some of my students call it the Barashango dictum, because uh, one of the things that I taught in my classrooms is usually what is good for us is bad to them, and what is good to them is bad for us. The, uh, irrecon the theory of irreconcilable opposites, that's what I call it. Everybody else got theories, I guess I can have one. I'm gonna deal with just one more because I want to get off of this and get into an, another holiday or two if I got time here. You all right? Yes. But I can't leave here without talking about the pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> and what that means. Now, when you had your children running around there playing with blindfold on, pin the tail on the donkey, this is what it means historically. On Satan's Sabbath and other uh, festivals of the Druids, they selected a jackass or goat. And that goat was blessed and sanctified to represent Satan because up there at that time there was no difference between Satan and God in Europe. It didn't make any difference. Christianity hadn't come in or any of the other things. So it didn't make any difference to them. And as a part of the ritual, you were blindfolded and you had to show that you were a committed devotee to Shahween or Satan by kissing the donkey or the goat smack down in the middle of. Don't take Shakamusa's word for it. They have wood carvings with that on it. They have it in art books of old Europe where they show that taking place. If you don't want to believe, go to the library and look at some of them things up, you'll see it. And some of the encyclopedias on Halloween, they will show it to you. 
Some other people have written books on it. When the Romans came in in 55, before the Common Era, under Julius Caesar, and in 46 under Claudius Caesar, they modified that with one of their uh, rituals, which was the kissing of the tail of the horse at the temple of Pomona. They didn't have to go smack dab in the middle. <laughs> Just the hair on the tail. But some kissing was done. <laughs> I wonder if that's where we got that from, saying that. <laughs> And we can say it too, uh, and be serious. Especially sister, sister can say it for anybody I ever. <laughs> so we ought to think about that before we say that to each other. So they brought the tail, of it, and so now instead of the child walking up blindfold, kissing the things back dab in the middle of the behind, it pin the tail on it. So that's what your children are vicariously doing when that happens, brothers and sisters. Let me move on. Let me talk about misgiving for a minute, all right? Got a second on that. Why do I call it uh, Misgiving Day? A celebration of horrors. Because first of all, the good pilgrim fathers that you hear so much about were actually homeless people looking for somewhere to stay. <laughs> Not that there's anything evil about that, because there's a lot of good people out there that's homeless today. But these suckers have been thrown out of Europe <laughs> and were considered to be criminals. They didn't come over here to bring the benighted heathen the, the gospel dispensation. And they introduce them to Jesus. They got some money to get the ship to speed well and the Mayflower. And the people who put up the money said, Look, when you get there, send us back furs. All you can take. And whatever else you can take to pay this money back, and we can make a profit off this venture. Well, Speedwell didn't make it, only Mayflower got in. And as Will Rogers said, white man said the pilgrims got off the Mayflower, hit the shore, fell on their knees and thanked God, got up and fell on the Indians. And that's exactly what they did. Look, look at here, brothers and sisters. I want you to check this out a minute, man. I know, son, you already know this, but probably most of you already know this now. Dr. Felder and spread the books all over everywhere. But it did not hurt us to go over it again because every year you go over to George Washington and chop down a cherry tree, which was absolutely never told a lie, which was a lie. You can't be a general without practicing deception. Diversionary tactics is a lie. You're making a person think you're over there when you're over there. That's a lie. You can't say this man never told a lie. I mean, generals have to lie <laughs> to win wars. And he won very few. Didn't win any, actually, until the black folks got in there. But that's another story. And I'm not proud of that either. But check this out. These people come here now. They dock outside on the ship, the Mayflower, and 42 men of the 120 some odd people they have aboard, 130, 42 white males make a compact to decide what is going to happen in this land. They didn't ask anybody who was living here what was going to happen. They decided it. The white male ego decided it. Not that I'm letting a female off the hook, because I ain't. She spawns them, produces them nurtures them. They get here, they're hungry, they're starving, they don't know what to do to survive, and who welcomes them, even after the Columbus experience, who welcomes them? The indigenous red man. Come on in, brother. We'll feed you, we'll take care of you. He does it for a year. When that year is up, the pilgrims go back out to their ship, after building them a log cabin, they put a cannon on top of that log cabin that is directed at the Indian village. I'm just using that term for convenience, because I don't like the term, I'm just using that for convenience right now. 
1621, they had their first Thanksgiving celebration for having survived, and Governor Bradford of the Massachusetts colony wrote that most, over 40, some of them had died, and scarcely five or six remained sane who was there. The rest of them were totally crazy, mad. He wrote that. That's what that's documented. It's out the archives, and that they government got it. By the next celebration of Thanksgiving, this is what took place. It was the red man who brought the venison and brought the turkey and all those things. You, 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 you see these things with the pilgrim and his stove type hat and some bell gun and then the turkey smiling, walking beside him and the Indians flipping and dancing because he's so happy this white man and brought him God and Jesus. You sat in the classroom just like I did. When they would talk about the pilgrim with tears running down your eyes, the poor pilgrim. <laughs> I'm quoting in, uh, uh, that prolific historian and writer, Professor Joel A. Rogers here. And he says that the early American whites were cruel. Connecticut whites massacred the Pequot Indians. Infants were torn from their mother's breast and hacked to pieces. The heads of the parents were chopped off and kicked about in the streets. Maybe where the Thanksgiving Thursday football game comes from. <laughs> Governor Bradford wrote, it was a fearful sight to see them frying in the fire and streams of blood quenching the same and terrible was the stench and the stink thereof. But the victory seemed a sweet sacrifice, and they, the whites, gave praise thereof to God. I don't think I need to say any more about Misgiving Day now. That was enough for me. They were some of the lowest, most degenerate people they sent over here to these colonies were mostly criminals. They emptied out Newgate Prison, Oxford Gore, and a whole bunch of others there. The daughters of the American Revolution were whores, prostitutes, and harlots sent over here. That's what they spawned America with. And you wonder why the American government, even today, in 1991, can't do right? They have a criminal element in them. Why they can't keep crime cooled out? Because they are criminals. They're probably more tolerant of crime than any other nation in the world. Because in their subconscious, they know what their history goes back to. Billy the Kid and all those criminals, Jesse James were their heroes. All criminals. Ponce de Leon and Pizarro, hero, criminals, committing genocides against people. So that's enough about Misgiving Day. Let's go on to Xmas a minute. I know I, I don't have much longer there. Let me deal with that. Now, I don't want you to think I'm an unhappy man. I'm a happy man. <laughs> I'm happy, first of all, because I'm an African. Every morning I wake up, I look in the mirror, and I say, thank you. <laughs> and I mean that. Win, lose, or draw. When black people make me mad, and they can make me so mad, I'm still happy to be an African. It's still my blood. <laughs> the greatest experience I've ever had in my whole entire life was the African experience. I have not always had the African experience. I'm a born again African. Because I didn't always know I was an African. And since I've been born again to the Africanist, it is the most wondrous experience I've ever had. And the study of our history is just so overwhelming to me. It just takes me out. And this is a drop in the bucket. We haven't even begun to study this. Our scholars, as great and wonderful as they are, haven't even touched the surface and they know that. We all know that. Look what we have to bequeath to our children now. The thing that opened up, the bull's out the barn now. You can't do nothing, you can't shut the door. They just best go on and leave us alone. They gonna call down God's anger on them and he gonna use us to demonstrate it. <laughs> now, when we get to Xmas, the merry mess, I know some of y'all really get mad with me about that one because I, I got to admit, 
I mean, the music and the, all that. I mean, that's some. It's it, 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 the way they portray it is pretty, man. I mean, it's tempting. It's pretty. I like the music. And every year I used to go to see the Nutcracker Suite. In fact, I conducted the Nutcracker Suite. <laughs> I still like the music. <laughs> but when I studied it, went into it historically and found out what it was all about, that was based in the Satanism practices once again of the Druids and all that. And I, I don't have time to go on that tonight, but I do discuss it in the book. There were several, que or several questions that came up. And one was, first of all, it is not the birthday of Jesus. First of all, it is not. Jesus ben Joseph of the house of Panther, maybe you might want to question me on that, was a black man, and I have, we have empirical fact. We're not saying it because we would like it to be so, because it makes us feel good to think that. It is a historical fact that you can't get around. Even Billy Graham, when they put him on the point in the 60s, said, well now, what color was Jesus? He said, uh, swathy. So they stopped this there. Okay. Said, so, well, it really doesn't make any difference, though, because he was for everybody. So they went on with that. And the swathy is the German word swats for black. That's what it was. You can't get around that. So here now they take the life of a black prophet, a liberator, because SGF Brandon in his book, Jesus and the Zealots, a white theologian at Manchester University, he begins the book with the first paragraph. The only thing known for certain about Jesus of Nazareth is that he was crucified as a rebel against the Roman Empire. And Donovan Joy says everything else is theological conjecture. Now that may be the only thing that Mr. Brandon knows, but I, while I was reading Mr. Brandon, I also read Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers says, moreover, the word Christ comes from the Indian word Krishna, which means the black one. And I also, having studied history, knew that he came from the tribe of Judah, which was the navy blue black tribe of the children of Israel. And the only one who could reign as a king and be received as a true prophet was he who was kissed of the sun because the Israelites, like the Bible says in Amos the ninth chapter and the seventh verse, are ye not unto me as the Ethiopians and the Egyptians, O Israel. We are of the same racial stock. But we don't have time to go into detail, but in God, the Bible, and the Black Liberation Struggle, I give documentation for that. They tell me they used that book in some seminaries around this country. There was an underground movement going on and those young ministers said, we come out, we're gonna start interjecting this to the people. And in some denominations, they have a groundswell coming up where they tell them they got to take that Eurocentric white supremacist imagery down out of the church. <laughs> so as they're pushing for that, the reason why they told me, when I met with them, they said, Brother Shocker, you're one of the pioneers here, and we appreciate what you've done. I didn't even know that was going on. They said, the reason why we seem to be moving slow, brother, is because, and I know why, because some brothers stood up and would tell the people and lost their whole congregations. So they said, we're going slow and feeding them a little at a time. <laughs> one brother got up preaching, because see, I'm crazy. It don't make me no different, you know? If you come, I'm happy. If you don't come, I got to do it anyway till the day I die. Even if I preach to the benches, I got to do it. One brother preached, was preaching on the, the Jesus as an African and his involvement in the liberation struggle, and the next week his church was empty. <laughs> Last time I saw him, he was walking up and down in front of the White House with a sign. That's what they did to him, man. But here you have a black man who was crucified or assassinated for rising up and seeking his people uh, to establish a kingdom of heaven on earth, which is a nation, not kingdom in heaven, but kingdom of heaven, fighting for liberation from the white Roman power structure. And the Romans didn't crucify him as a new prophet. They didn't crucify him as God or the son of God or the organizer of a new religion. What does it say? He stirred up the people. 
The charge was inciting to riot. That's what the charge was. Everything else came later. After the Europeans took him over, he became any and everything. Now, they fought over these different days once the Europe, because it began as the African Christian Church, and the Europeans took it, Rome took it militarily. Now, after Augustine and Origen and Tertullian and others had taught them, which they shouldn't have done in the first place, we always run over there telling them something and getting, getting the dirty end of the stick. So, so now, they had a problem they had to face because everybody in the world of peoples of color, and even many of the white people in Europe, uh, the Jews and so forth, having inherited that knowledge from the Iberians who was there, celebrated the winter solstice. The time when the earth tilts back towards the sun and we're moving back towards summertime now. And it was on December the 25th, around December the 22nd, and went on through some places December the 25th. And it was the birthday of Horus, or Haru, from which we get the word hero, the son of Oset and Asa, whom they misnomed Isis and Osiris, the birthday of Tammuz, the birthday of Mithra, just about any savior god around the world was born on this day. So they said, these people are not gonna let this go, so we're gonna have to have a birthday for ours. They came up with the 6th of January, the 16th of April, several days in April, uh, in August, some days in September, and they finally decided on December the 25th. When did they decide it? 325 years after the fact. When everybody that knew Jesus was gone away from here. Anybody who had some, may have had some birth records, didn't have any more. And how did they get people to accept it? Not through Septimus Dominum. <laughs> holy God, Holy Jesus, Mary Mother of God. Mm -mm. By the power of the sword. Constantine the Great at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Most everything you believe about Christianity was decided then and there. It was the cross and the sword. They didn't do it by praying. Because the African bishop said, this is not true what you say. Jesus is not one with God. He was a great prophet. They said, you either accept it or we run your behind out of here. So they ran them out. And they established it by the sword there. On, I think I've dealt with that. I'm not going to deal with Santa Claus now tonight. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about my train. I'll stay over if I have to. <laughs> Don't get this as often. Just be in Africa like this. All Africa. Santa Claus, or Sinterklaas, as the Dutch called him, is another name for Satan. How do I know that? All you have to do is look at the letters and mess with them a little bit and you see that. But also know that who this is supposed to be uh, uh, related to was one Saint Nicholas, who was supposed to be a bishop of Myra in the fourth century. Uh, of this era, of the common era. And he became the patron saint of thieves, pawnbrokers. Children, they threw children in there too. Thieves and pawnbrokers. Because thievery was all right in Europe as long as it was organized. They had guilds of thieves in Europe. No way you get locked up if you didn't belong to the guild. <laughs> if you was out there working on your own as an independent, that's the when they lock you behind up. But if you were protected by the guild, you could make it. And, 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 and St. Nicholas was the patron saint of that group and pirates. And he was also called Old Nick. 
which you don't have to take while you go back and study European language, which is another word for the devil. Because in there was always with the European an ambiguous aspect in anything they dealt with. And they had the devil or God or whatever, they were all, and that's why in the mistranslation uh, of the King James Version of the Bible, you will find all of these uh, um, contradictions. How can a divine, I'm using that term, I don't even like the term God, because the dog spelled backwards, but I'm just using it for convenience now. And there's a whole historical reason as to why. I can't go into that right now. How can a good, loving God Father, Africans always said mother, father, God, because you can't procreate nothing even on the spiritual level without the female and male aspect. <laughs> Only Europeans try that stuff. <laughs> even the divine creative intelligence in the universe got to hook up in the midnight hour <laughs> to make things happen. It's a holy thing. When you go about it right, but how can this good, loving father, as they call him, that could do no wrong, created the world and said, it is good, that is perfect, that created all things perfect, do all that and then have a devil in that world? Now, if God created everything according to their thinking, how in the deuce did the devil get there? If all the creation was done by God. Where did the devil come from? You gotta ask that question. If it was already there, how could it be there if God was greater than it? I'm, I'm asking some questions, and with, you know why I'm asking this question? Not to pick with you, or not to attack your belief system, because I, I don't mess with anybody's belief system, but I'm gonna deal with history, whether you agree with it or not. A lot of young people are asking these questions and we're giving them all kind of fantastic and mythological answers that do not make sense to them. And so they are seeking answers in the wrong place. And therefore, if God, and the Bible often says that God caused this evil to happen to this person, caused that evil to happen to that person, how can you be good and cause evil at the same time? What you're looking at is a mistranslation of the ancient text in the King James Version there. That's what you're looking at, a confusion there. So with the European, and I did that to demonstrate that the, those who mistranslated the text always had that idea that it was really no difference between them, between God and the devil. It all worked in the, all together there. Good and evil is whoever could sustain it by the sword that made it holy and righteous and just. There could be nothing no more evil than human enslavement. Nothing more evil than that. Nothing more evil than genocide. But as long as you could do it and get away with it, then you were ordained by what? God to do it. Because God let you get away with it. That's the Europeans thinking, his way of thinking. So this is how now Santa Claus becomes Satan that used to ride around on a gray donkey. They got a thing about that donkey, man. On Christmas Eve night, when everybody was scared to death because they said that night too that goblins and ghosts and things came out and messed with them. And he had this big weasel bowl filled with this intoxicating beverage that he would feed the goblins and keep them from messing with the people. And that's how he became Father Christmas. Also another word for him is Kris Kringle. Chris Kringle means the birth of the Christ child. Now this I got to ask you. Now wait a minute, so let's be logical. Let's put aside belief in all that. Let's be logical in our thinking. How can a little short, dumpy, fat, red suit, red and white suit and wearing puffy face white man be a representative of a one and the same of the Christ child born over in a hot land in Palestine, a black boy in a manger in a state who eventually was assassinated for rebelling against the Roman government. Where's the connection? But here's the foolishness of it. 
I don't mean to sound arrogant or anything, but it just sounds foolish to me. Look, these young people are coming to me with this and with them, to us with this. Now, either you're going to deal with reality with them or you're going to lose them altogether. But these fantasies are not going to keep it. They may have worked for you in your time because you didn't know any better. God winked on your ignorance because you didn't know no better. But now the door has been opened. The light is here. And if you fight against it, you fight against yourself. You prick against yourself in fighting against it. We not, I'm not trying to convert you to anything. I'm not trying to get you to join anything but yourself. I want you to do your own thinking. And you can't do your own thinking unless you know this as well as that. Then you got some information you can work with in your brain computer. Other than that, you'll be walking around supporting their system and keeping them going from now on. That's why God will have to kill you with them too because you won't let go. <laughs> So he gonna get him. He and she gonna get him. Ain't no doubt about that in my mind. I might not be allowed to see it, but they gonna get got. The law of karma is an immutable law. What goes around comes around. Never fail. All you gotta do is study history and you will see that. Now, here's the thing that shows the insanity that we have come into since we've been captivated here. You work hard to get money, and you got to do it. You're compelled to do it. It's a sin against God if you don't do it. You offend the baby Jesus if you don't do it. Get this money. I got to get this white man this money. <laughs> And he put you in a state of panic and hysteria. There's only 20 days left to Christmas. <laughs> only 15 days left to Christmas. Oh, oh. <laughs> and he come at you through your babies. Because you know, black folks don't like to deny their babies nothing. It's hard to say no to your babies. And they, they, they're lacking so much in the world today anyway, so you figure, at least I can give them this little bit of something. I know what you're thinking now. Let me ask you something though. How in the name of heaven do you do all this? You got to work hard and two and three extra jobs and wrapping packages and maces and stuff. Spending money you ain't got. Wait till the babies go to sleep at night. And then you go with your fool self. Shit, tip them out. <laughs> but you don't hear somewhere. They wake up the next morning, their eyes all bright and looking at stuff around the tree. Come here, baby, look what Santa Claus done done for you. <laughs> now, you can do what you want. Ain't no way in the world I'm gonna work my butt off. <laughs> Buy something for my children and tell them some white man did it. <laughs> <laughs> But here's a part of the mental genocide of that. You lied to your child for 10, 12 years. You may think that's a light thing, but it isn't. You have your child believing in something, and I mean we believe in it. I was hurt, I cried for two days when they told me it wasn't no Santa Claus. I cried, man. And I'm trying to figure out how can my mama, who was a beautiful woman, who loved me and worked hard, right now, work, white, working in the white folks' house, washing their clothes, and ironing their clothes, and rubbing their floors, and done, take care of me. How can she lie to me like that? And it establishes, if the child is not conscious, it establishes subconsciously 
a distrust. Time is running out. <laughs> it establishes a distrust in anything else you say. So now by the time they get to adolescence, you wonder why they don't trust what you say to them. And you don't lie to them like that. For what? To give white folks the credit? I'm going to close out on this because and, and, and I, I, got to, I got to say just a little bit about the 4th of July here. But I got to say this too. Can I just a minute? <laughs> Many times I, I go to prison. I didn't know I had such a, you know, bro, every brother passed books all around the prison. I went down one a hall of one prison and was like I was returning the conqueror from victory. All over there, man. Oh, are the brothers in prison be reading the books? And I went to one prison, man, heard all this cheering all over there. Where, 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 where they, they, how they know me? So I get to go and talk to the brothers in the prison lives. See? So I'm in prison talking to the brother, and a lot of them I find got armed robbery charges, and many of those charges fell during the season of the year. So I asked him, I said, brother, what, 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 what's responsible for that? Why did you do that? Because most of those crimes are committed against other black people. See? So well, why do you do that, brother? He said, well, now look, I'm going to tell you. This is what some of the brothers told me. He said, when, you, when your children keep saying that this is Christmas and this new thing coming out and that thing coming out, and your woman keep putting pressure on you about you got to get some money and get some Christmas in here, because I know I can identify with that. That's why I looked up with the sister I was married, you know, the African married sister. I've been through that. I let some sisters go behind that. <laughs> And that's before I found out the truth about it. <laughs> Put that pressure on me, and I had to get this money. I couldn't get no job. I didn't have no job, so I had to go get it the best way I can. Because when I walk before my children and my woman, I want to look like a man. Now, you done wrapped his manhood up into what he can get you materially from this white man. Look at that. And then counseling with some of the sisters. They are the, the, the wives and girlfriends and things of these men in there. I said, wouldn't it be better for you to have your man home for your children? Wouldn't that be a better Christmas for you than this man to be in jail? Behind these material things aren't gonna last. And you know how it goes. Halfway through the day, most of the stuff is torn up laying in the corner. <laughs> you look at it and realize you have been living in a fool's paradise, so to get over that, you break out the bottle and have Christmas cheer. <laughs> and then once you get that alcohol in you and start thinking about you to spend money you don't have, <laughs> thinking about how you gonna get your rent paid next month or your mortgage paid or feed your babies in January, then you resort to the ritual of busting each other upside the head. I don't know about you, but when I was coming up, I couldn't figure out why on such a beautiful day, <laughs> when I had all these toys and it was so lovely, and Santa Claus and Jesus and everybody had come, <laughs> and everybody was so happy, that a fight always broke out for the day was over. <laughs> now I know. Fourth of July, and I'm finished. Just take me a minute on this one. I don't want to take advantage, because I know you got other things to do, but Fourth of July. Why do I refer to it as the Fourth of July? White folks came to me and said, black man, if you help me win my freedom, from the tyranny of King George, I will give you your freedom. Because every one of those dogs that wrote, we hold these 12, these Jews to be self-evident that all men are created equal were either slaveholders or had made their fortune off of the slave trade in some way or form or fashion. All 54 of those dirt farmers that met at the first and second Continental Congress and Jews among them. That's right. Thomas Jefferson.
Thomas Jefferson, the great architect of freedom, <laughs> who wasn't misguided entertainer, saying, you know, one who, who wrote the document and signed the document that freed all men. It did not free all men. It only freed the rich landed gentry in the 13 colonies. It didn't even free the common man in the 13 colonies. And it damn sure didn't free us. He had slaves and he had this penchant for messing with adolescent girls, impregnating them. And when he had the black babies from those girls, from those slave girls, he would take them at six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old and work them in his nail factory. I'm supposed to honor that? The shot that was heard around the world, I'll be finishing in a minute. The shot that was heard around the world was not fired at Lexington. And it wasn't even heard around the world. The rest of the world didn't give a damn about it. Excuse me for cussing so much. That bullet landed in the chest of Crispus Adams, which I am not proud of, because he was a chump. A misguided chump. Why you say that, Brother Shaka? Why you be so cold? he just come off the plantation himself. And now he gonna stand there and fight for the slave owner. If you got to catch a bullet for something, catch it for them brothers and sisters back there wanting their freedom. <laughs> and they repaid him by celebrating his birthday until they came up with the July 4th thing. On March the 5th, they call it Christmas Addicts Day, and they made a statue to him with a white woman standing over top of a, an eagle, spread his wings, just had his name, he put his picture on it. That's how much they thought about him. But one of the British generals came here because, see, what had happened is the British started recruiting the black slaves. Said, we're going to put a gun in your hand. Okay. We're going to put a gun in your hand, and we're going to let you shoot at white folks. Blood start joining the British Army by the hundreds and thousands. And so George Washington, who didn't want black folks in the army in the first place, said, we don't arm the blacks. We're not going to win this war. And one of the generals that came over here said, we're not at war with the 13 colonies. We at war with Ethiopia. There were so many black folks there in that war. Now, after we won the war for them, they plunged us deeper in slavery than ever we had been. I'm going to read this closing statement. I'm really finished now. On the 4th of July. I'm going to call on Brother Frederick Douglass now, who said it so well. And the white folks can really be arrogant. They call this man an ex slave, fighting for the abolition of other slaves, to come in the year 1852 and give a speech on his love for America, on their 76th anniversary of America's independence. And old Fred came. Yes, he did. And this is what Fred said. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? Our answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelties to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty an unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgiving with all your religious parades and solemnity are to him mere bombast, deceptions, and pious hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, Roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Travel through South America. Search out every abuse. And when you have found the last, lay your facts side by side of the everyday practices of this nation. And you will say with me 
that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Brothers and sisters, that is what the 4th of July and any other European holiday means to me. So when you, and when you are celebrating, make sure you are celebrating that which has brought life to you, which has enhanced your life, which has advanced your life, which is a part of your great